Hello and uh, welcome to uh, the European Report. So we're here in our London studios because the, the European Parliament is currently in uh, recess. So we'll be there back next month. But in today's program, we'll be discussing the Iran deal and asking, is this good for the Middle East? Is this good for Europe? Is this good for Britain? Or will this lead to war? And uh, my guest on today's program is uh, Dr. Meridad Kansari, uh, who is the Secretary General of BAM, um, an organization of economic reconstruction and national reconciliation. Meridad, it, it's uh, a real pleasure to have you on today's program, particularly with your knowledge and expertise you. uh, on Iran. But can you share with our, our viewers a little bit about your background and the incredible work that you've done on behalf of the Iranian people over the years? Uh, well, thank you very much. Well, uh, I, I am a former Iranian diplomat, uh, and uh, I have lived in Europe since the Iranian Revolution and have tried to do my best to promote uh, the correct kind of change that our people need and deserve in Iran. And uh, I think that, you know, over the, year, over the years, though we have not succeeded in bringing about the exact kind of changes that you know we have wanted but we have been able to sort of move away from uh, hardcore fundamentalism and essentially uh, create an atmosphere in which decision makers in Iran have as a consequence of their own experiences come to see that uh, to survive and to live and to prosper in the modern world that you have to move away from extremist positions and in that respect I think that uh, the kind of changes that we have be, we, we have witnessed especially in the last two years uh, since the removal of Ahmadinejad from the Iranian political scene has promised a completely different outlook than what we were witnessing there was a time that there was no alternative but regime change in Iran but now we are seeing that reform is being initiated and the government is actively trying to pursue that. And that is a cause that has to be assisted, especially since it prevents Iran from disintegrating from within and for violence and terrorism to replace the kind of domestic stability that exists in that country at this time, which has made it an island of stability in a... In a in a region that is, you know, uh, you can see uh, how violent and how, uh, you might say, unstable it is. So it is my work over the years has been to try to promote this. And I believe that economic reconstruction is what the Iranian people want, is what the Iranian government at this time is trying to achieve. And national reconciliation is something that would allow Iranian people to work out their differences in an atmosphere that is free of violence and free of sectarianism and the kind of things that we have seen uh, do so much damage in places like Syria and Iraq and uh, other countries such as Libya and, uh, and the like in North Africa. Do you think there's any hope there could be a transition from a, a Shia-led theocracy to democracy in Iran? Uh, because so many of the um, your the people that you represent, the Iranian people themselves, are, are hungry for similar freedoms that we have here in the West. I think, I think that, uh, you know, uh, one has to come to the conclusion that, I mean, based on my own experiences, and don't get me wrong, I do want those ideals which I have worked for all my life to become, to sort of to, to, to become a reality in my country. But there is more than one way to skin a cat, as one can say. <laughs> and uh, there are different ways of trying to achieve that sort of thing. And what is important is to see what the Iranian people want, what the Iranian people are willing to sacrifice for. Because minus commitment and sacrifice on the part of the masses of people, not intellectuals or, you might say, uh, uh, political ideologues, you have to have something that carries the people with you. The people in Iran, I'm sure that they want more freedom. They want democracy. They want all the things that, you know, uh, are modern and, and people expect. But they don't want that at the cost of 
losing what, has, what they have left, which is tranquility and stability in their lives. People in Iran may not have democracy like people in Britain, but unlike people in Syria or Iraq, you don't have suicide bombers, you know, strolling around the streets or explosions here and there every day and 24-7 and 365 days per year. So that is the scenario that has to be avoided. Now, what has happened is as a consequence of policies, bad policies, taken over the years by the regime, which has isolated Iran uh, and damaged its economy, people have suffered, people have become weaker, people have not had the, uh, you might say, the strength or the backup to be able to demand the kind of things that they rightly deserve. That's why economic reconstruction is so important. And because at the end of the day, economic reconstruction enables the people. And once people are enabled, then they are able to seek whatever they want and move in any direction they want. They have to want to do it. You know, people can inspire them with ideas and thoughts, but at the end of the day, they have to do it, but they have to be able to do it at their own pace and at their own time. Uh, president Khatami, the former Iranian president, uh, said something about maybe 10, 15 years ago, which I think rings very much true today. I didn't pay that much attention to it at the time. Uh, and that is that democracy is not a project. Democracy is a process. You cannot push a button and for a community that has not been used to that sort of thing Absolutely. to become democratic all of a sudden. We are seeing this most blatantly and evidently in the Arab countries where the so-called Arab Spring took over. Uh, in Libya, you had one Colonel Gaddafi. Now you have 20 Colonel Gaddafis. In everywhere, look at what's happening in Syria in the name of democracy or what happened in Egypt or the violence that we're witnessing now in the best of these cases, which is Tunisia. So the point is that, that the communities have to be ready to accept these notions and to play by the rules according to the rules. In Iran, we are way ahead of all these countries because we experienced the constitutional revolution more than 100 years ago. But at the same time, we are not ready to embrace it and the people are not willing to make the necessary sacrifices to embrace it at this time. So we have to move in a way or redirect our emphasis in a way that is in line with the aspirations of the people and what they consider to be most important and improving their economic law which would give them jobs, give them social security, give them pensions for every Iranian, deal with their educational needs, deal with their health requirements. These are the kind of things that have been missing and these are the kind of things that have a priority over other issues. So by giving them all these things, then you are obviously uh, you know, uh, opening up the ways for greater improvements which will naturally follow. Yes, and uh, which also leads us on to the um, the Iran deal that was brokered last month in uh, in uh, July. Um, what it, what is your take on this Iran deal? Is it is this a good deal? Is it is this deal going to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons, or is it going to lead to a, a future war in the Middle East? No, I think that uh, this deal is the best thing that could have been achieved at this particular time, and it certainly diffuses many, you might say, uh, worst scenarios that were waiting, you know, in the background if a deal of this nature could not have been reached. So uh, I don't believe that uh, saying that war would have happened if this deal had not been reached is a false premise. What options would, would there have been for the West and for countries like Israel who have been at the forefront of drawing international attention to the threat posed by a nuclear Iran if no deal had been reached, if Iran had gone on with, the, with its nuclear projects that could have given them the capacity to develop a nuclear weapon. So this deal, although uh, it does not prevent Iran eternally from uh, uh, acquiring nuclear weapons, and I have to say this to you as an Iranian, that uh, 
no one has the right to try to prevent us from eternally achieving what other countries have the capacity to achieve. It has to be the decision of the Iranian people to say that we don't need this, just as people in Western Europe who have the similar capacities opt not to use it or opt not to go for building nuclear weapons. Do you think the Germans can't build nuclear weapons? Do you think that the Japanese cannot build nuclear weapons? Why don't they do it? Because it's not in their interest. So we have politicians like myself who have argued all, over the years, for the last 15 years at least, for the last 12 years since the nuclear issue has been an issue, that it is not in the interest of the Iranian people to go in this direction. But that doesn't mean that the Iranian people should be told that, no, you forever cannot do this. They will never accept this from anybody. Yeah. But what has happened is that for the next 10 to 15 years, as a result of the kind of pressure, as a result of the kind of publicity, the kind of, you might say, bad press that Iran has gotten, and the, uh, you know, the lack of trust, lack of confidence that has come to exist about the Iranian uh, government, this agreement provides an opportunity for confidence building, for trust in an atmosphere that is not war, that is not violent, and paves the way, you know, for better understanding. And at the end of the day, I think that once the Iranian economy is, gets going, if it does get going, because this agreement provides a fantastic opportunity for the government to focus on economic issues and try to help the lot of the Iranian people, then the Iranian people will see that what is the point of having nuclear weapons? Because nuclear weapons does not make Iran more secure. It adds nothing. It has no add-on value to the lives of ordinary citizens. And then there will be decision and, the gov and subsequent governments, I'm sure, will think twice about ever wanting to, you know, backtrack and pursue the kind of policies that had isolated Iran and uh, ostracized it. In the, in the international community. And uh, let's see now, last month, as the Iranian deal was brokered by uh, Iran and the international community. Optimism in the Coburg Hotel in Vienna. All the hard work has paid off and we sealed the deal. God bless our people. The words of a diplomat quoted in press agencies indicate that a deal has been reached in Austria on limiting Iran's nuclear program in return for the lifting of sanctions. Details are emerging of the agreement in which it's reported Iran has accepted a so-called snapback plan that will restore sanctions in 65 days if it violates the deal which will curb the country's nuclear program. Diplomats are reported as saying a UN arms embargo would remain in place for five years and UN missile sanctions would stay in place for eight years. The six world powers involved in negotiations for the past two weeks want Iran to scale back its sensitive nuclear activities to ensure it cannot build a nuclear weapon. Tehran has always denied that is an ambition. And uh, that was the Iran deal that was brokered uh, last month in, in July. Uh, Merida, there, there's a very good article here written by uh, David Horowitz of uh, the Times of Israel in which he points through 16 major points of flaws within the uh, Iran deal. Firstly, says that the uh, Iran deal uh, required as a condition for this deal to disclose the previous military dimensions of its nuclear program to come clean on its violations in order to both ensure effective inspections of all relevant facilities and to shatter the Iranian dispelled myth that is never been breached is non-proliferation obligation. And he says uh, no. We also got uh, has the uh, uh, Iranian regime been required to hold all its uh, Iranian enrichment, including thousands of centrifuges uh, spinning at its main Natanz enrichment facility says no. The deal specifically legitimizes the uh, enrichment under certain eroding uh, limitations. It also then goes on to say, has the Iranian regime been required to shut down and dismantle its Iraq heavy water uh, reactor and plutonium production plant? It says no, it will convert, not dismantle the facility under a highly complex process. Um, and also says no to additional heavy water reactors to accumulate heavy water in Iran will expire after 15 
15 years. He says, has the Iranian regime been required to shut down and dismantle the underground uranium enrichment facility uh, built secretly at Fordo? Uh, and he said no. Has the Iranian regime been required to halt its ongoing missile development? No. Has the Iranian regime been required to halt research and development to uh, uh, faster centrifuges that enable it to break out the bomb far more rapidly than is currently the case? He said uh, the current deal legitimizes the ongoing R&D under certain eroding limitations. Uh, he goes on to say as well that has the Iranian regime been required to submit anywhere, anytime inspections of any and all facilities instead of engaging in rogue uh, nuclear related activity? It says no, the deal, pres uh, deal describes the considerable length of a very protracted process of advance warning and consultation. It says has the international community established procedures setting out how it responds to different classes of Iranian violations to ensure that the international community can act with sufficient speed and efficiency to thwart uh, a, a breakout to the bomb? The answer is no. Has the regime been required to halt its arming, financing and training of Hezbollah? A terrorist army in the south of Lebanon? No. Has the Iranian regime been required to surrender for trial members of its leadership placed on Interpol watch list for their alleged involvement in the bombings by Hezbollah suicide bomber of the uh, AMIA, the uh, Jewish Community Centers in Buenos Aires in 94 that resulted in the death of uh, 85 people? No. This has the Iranian regime undertaken to close 80 estimated cultural centers in South America? from which it uh, allegedly fosters terror networks, it says no. Has the Iranian regime agreed to stop inciting hatred amongst its people against Israel and the United States to stop its relentless calls for the annihilation of Israel? No. Has the Iranian regime agreed to halt executions currently running at an average of some three a day, the highest rate for 20 years? The answer no. Does the nuclear deal shatter the painstakingly constructed sanctions regime that has forced Iran to the negotiating table? Yes. Will the deal usher a new era of global interaction with Iran, reviving the Iranian economy, releasing financial resources and that Iran can use to bolster its military and terrorist networks? Yes. Does the deal, nuclear deal further cement Iran's repressive and ideolog ideological regime in power? Yes. Um, and the Israeli perspective is that this is an incredibly bad deal, including the Republicans in the United States. Um, in light of all this, uh, how has the regime changed, in your opinion? Well, I think, first of all, uh, one thing that uh, Mr. Horowitz didn't say, which the deal didn't do, uh, the deal didn't stop or prevent the Iranian people from breathing oxygen either. You know, so uh, that must, must, might also be <laughs> a further add-on to, to, to the list of uh, 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 remarks that he has made. But the fact is that... Uh, six international powers, six top international powers have sat with the government of Iran and with the support of the IAEA and reached this agreement. Uh, in the assertions that you read out, it's uh, half truth, half lies. There are certain aspects of what is being asserted, which is correct, but then half of it is omitted. But to make the long story short, the fact is that uh, Iran's right to enrich uranium has been accepted. This was something that had been denied as a consequence of a number of UN Security Council resolutions. Those, that, those Security Council resolutions had been imposed because Iran had been seen to have been in violation of the NPT agreement. But the NPT agreement allows the right to enrichment if it is properly monitored and properly supervised. So what has happened is they have given Iran the right to do what it could have done under the MPT, but with proper supervision and monitoring. So they have corrected and they have punished Iran in the last 12 years because it had violated certain terms of the MPT agreement. 
Sorry, can you just explain to our, our viewers what the MPT agreement is? It's the is? Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Iran was a signatory to this international treaty uh, as, as far back as 1968. What it does, it says that all countries who sign up to this, uh, you know, are obligated not to pursue nuclear weapons, but they are allowed to pursue a peaceful use of nuclear energy. And in pursuing the peaceful use of nuclear energy, they have the right to enrich uranium, but they have to be supervised by uh, the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. Now, what has happened is that Iran began doing some of these things without informing or without going through the correct procedure and informing the IAEA authorities in advance. And when it was seen to have been in breach of that, it was punished for its non-cooperation in getting it right. What has happened now is that as a result of this agreement, this matter has been settled. So Iran will act according to its treaty obligations and it will be supervised. The minute that Iran is seen to be violating this, then the punishment is once again restored or the sanctions, etc., etc., uh, kick back in. Now, it's interesting to note that the two nuclear powers in the Middle East, which is Israel and Pakistan, are not, both of them are not signatories to the NPT or to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So in this respect, you know, you have to say, when you put, you know, this is a response to Mr. Horowitz, that, that you have to put, when you put everything in, into context, then what is happening with Iran is not that outlandish now that these corrections have been made. Now, Iran, I opposed Iranian policy when they were violating the NPT and their commitments and their international obligations. But if they sign to go along with those, you can't punish them for doing something that is expected of a nation state, you know, in the international community. Now, the, 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 the points that he made about the Iraq, you know, uh, plant, that is being redesigned. That is part of the agreement. Iraq will not be able to produce plutonium. Fordo, which was going to be dismantled, will not be dismantled, but it will not, uh, it will not be engaged in having centrifuges. It will be an R&D facility. All of these things are supervised. They have 24-7 cameras from the IAEA there. The minute Iran uh, violates these things, everybody will know. Now, you have to give a little credit to these five plus one people who had opposed Iran so vigorously in terms of not allowing any leeways. Now, the point is that this, all of these restrictions eventually come to some uh, form of an ending in 15 years' time. At the end of that 15 years, Iran may choose or may opt to once again go back to the kinds of suspicious policies that had led Iran to this dilemma in the first place. But then again, it may not. We don't know what's going to happen in 15 years. But we know that for the next 10, 15 years, the threat of another unwanted war in the Middle East has been set aside. Now, when it comes to other things that has been mentioned, it has to be said that, I mean, the American Secretary of State, British Foreign Secretary, all the key players, you know, in the West have said, this agreement pertains only to the nuclear issue. This is not a comprehensive agreement with Iran over all outstanding issues. The sanctions that are going to be removed are sanctions that have to do with Iran's nuclear case. They do not have anything to do with issues like terrorism or human rights or the kind of sanctions that exist over those issues. Those, those sanctions will remain in place. Iran's missile, new, uh, missile activities is not part of Iran's nuclear agreement. Many people have tried to attach it, these two together, and in a way they are attached in the sense that if you build a nuclear bomb, you need a vehicle to deliver it. But strictly speaking, 
these two issues are not the same. So uh, you have to put these things into perspective. Iran's behavior in the region, its support for Hezbollah, has nothing to do with Iran's you know, uh, issues over the nuclear issue. Those are issues that need to be separated. Those differences continue to remain. What has happened and what one can sort of say, be a little bit positive about is the fact that because we have reached an agreement over this nuclear issue, which was the most potent and the most, you might say, uh, uh, acute difference between Iran and the West, there is a possibility that this success can be used to negotiate over other issues that have kept Iran and the West apart from one another in order to persuade the Iranian leadership to change their ways, etc., etc., etc. This can happen. Yeah. I mean, look, look uh, I, you know, international diplomacy plays a very important part, and it's certainly better than actually going to war. But, but when you actually have a regime like the Islamic Republic of Iran, and certainly with um, Rouhani's predecessor, Ahmadinejad, who constantly called for the destruction of the State of Israel and the Jewish people, uh, denied that the Holocaust actually n e ever happened, uh, and then is the main sponsor of international terrorism. One of the great dangers that uh, Israel sees, particularly in the Middle East, and also the concern of the Arab states and also the Republican Party in the states, is that the West has been engaged in a war with the Islamic Republic of Iran for 36 years now. They, they are the world's leading state sponsor of international terrorism. They sponsor uh, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, uh, which they have 100,000 missiles and rockets aimed upon Israel. They sponsor and support Hamas, who's uh, also another genocidal terrorist organization. Uh, they've caused upheaval in, in Yemen. They're supporting the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria with the deployment of the Iranian Revolution Guards and the besieges. Um, propping up his regime against uh, probably what is now ISIS or something worse has come in the case. Um, is, is, isn't there a great danger that Iran gets what it wants in terms of economic sanctions at least to the sum of $150 million, uh, billion, yeah, yeah. Uh, which can encourage greater support of terrorism? And if Iran does be able to reach um, breakout because the sanctions are then uh, released, this will only then encourage hardliners within the regime to continue their support for international terrorism, making them closer to developing nuclear weapons, and therefore their bigger threat, because the regime, if it has nuclear weapons, is able then to threaten and control and dominate the region like never before. And, and the difference, I think, uh, prior to the revolution in 79, when the Shah was in power, no one had a problem with Iran wanting to develop nuclear weapons or nuclear energy because they knew that it was not a dangerous regime. The difference is this is a dangerous, sheer theocracy to have nuclear weapons or that capabilities would make Iran a superpower in the Middle East that could threaten and dominate the West. Well, it's... I mean, I think that these are, these are uh, certainly valid points, especially if somebody like Ahmadinejad was in charge of Iran. Ahmadinejad is a pariah. He sort of could not have been the, he's the worst advertisement for Iran. You know, and, uh, but the point is that, that the Rouhani government is the antithesis of Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad, there was no alternative but to try to overthrow him. But the Iranian people cleverly, patiently, <laughs> having put up with him, forced the supreme leader in their own way, who had backed Ahmadinejad in 2009, to move away from him. Now, the fact is that when you look at the region, and if you put, again, things into perspective, First of all, Iran is the, one of the largest countries in the region. Iran has a historical right to be a regional superpower. It was under the Shah. It was an undisputed, and the West never questioned it because the Shah was pro-West. Now, these people came, and they started pursuing anti-Western policies, which ostracized them. And it has taken them a long time to try and reassess their positions. But the fact is that they have opened up to the United States. They are talking to the United States. These are things that have come about in the last two years. And then you look at the region. You mentioned Assad. They support Assad. 
or they support Hezbollah and or Hamas, for example. Uh, as you may know, they have now uh, invited Mahmoud Abbas is going to be visiting Tehran in the very shortly. So that's a shift that had never happened before, Mahmoud Abbas, because of because of the fact that Hamas is against Iranian policies in Syria. The yes. relationship has become estranged. So Iran has moved in favor of trying to promote, you might say, some sort of a better solution vis-a-vis -vis the Israel-Palestine problem by, you know, inviting uh, Mahmoud Abbas and trying to play a positive role. Now, Shia fundamentalism has been a scourge for the international community in the last 30 years, until very recently, when something else started creeping up, and that is Sunni fundamentalism which makes the Iranians and their supporters look like pussycats. But this is a reality, because at no time in the history of confrontation between Shiite Iran and its surrogates have, has anyone witnessed the kind of scenes or the kinds of scenarios that has been promoted by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so on. From 9-11 onwards, you look, at, you look at the emergence of these radicals who have been termed as the West's number one enemies, you know, according to the United States, Britain, Europe, and everyone. Yet, if you look at it, who today, when ISIS, for example, is on, at the top of everyone's agenda and everyone is looking at it, people in this country, in Britain, are concerned that uh, young Muslims in this country are fleeing the country to go and fight for ISIS. Who are the financial backers of ISIS? They are the traditional allies of the Western world in the Arab world, and especially in the Persian Gulf region. It's money, quite apart from the kind of money that they sort of manage to make on their own by selling oil and things like that, but they are supported from individuals, foundations, governments in the Middle East. Who is fighting ISIS on the ground? It's the traditional enemy of the West for the last 36 years, which is Iran. You mentioned Assad. Assad is not Florence Nightingale. <laughs> That's an understatement. As, as no other uh, leader of a stable country in the Middle East. But what is important, who is Assad being opposed to? Uh, who, is, who is he being opposed by? By radical Islamic extremists, ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, things like that. Who are they, who are getting their funds from where? You mentioned Israel. Israel may not like the Assad regime, but they have had no problem in the last 40, 45 years in their borders with the Assad regime. Is it in the interest of Israel, for example, that Assad should go and to be replaced by ISIS and so on and so forth who want to start a new war and to reinvigorate the general population into a new kind of uh, jihad against Israel? No. Do the people of Syria, the ordinary people of Syria, who in the name of democracy have started this terrible civil war, which has led to so much tragedy be better off under ISIS? I don't think anybody would agree with that. So the point is that we have reached a, p a position where everything needs to be revalued and reevaluated. In this reevaluation, if the Iranian regime moves in the right direction, as they have over the nuclear agreement, if they can be persuaded, and that's through diplomacy and negotiations and talks, not through threats and ostracization to move in the direction that they've been moving and they are pa moving at this point that we are speaking on many of these fronts. They are moving in parallel with the West. And the West traditional uh, allies in the Middle East are moving in the opposite direction. I think this has to be acknowledged and this is a very important point. And you say, for example, uh, the threat of Iran. What threat? If minus the nuclear issue has been put aside, you look at Iran's conventional military forces. Compare the Iranian Air Force. You say, oh, if, for example, there is a 
dispute between Iran and Saudi Arabia over Yemen, if there is some sort of engagement in the air, if things should lead to that, Iran has 200 somewhat, 200 and something dilapidated aircraft, <laughs> whereas Saudis have 714 top line, you know, uh, aircraft at their disposal. The UAE, with a population of maybe 100,000 people, have over 300 frontline aircraft as compared to Iran. So, and the budget, the defense budget of Iran, which Kerry keeps repeating in Congress, is one-tenth, or Obama keeps repeating, is one-tenth of the uh, Arab countries of the Gulf. So when you put all of these things into perspective, what I'm saying is that the Iranian regime uh, is still, you know, dominated by a very small constituency of very hardcore elements who are dangerous. 36 years ago, these people believed in the Islamic Revolution, they believed in Khomeini, and they believed in resurgent Islam. Those are not the issues that motivate them today. Their position and power and wealth is what keeps them going. But they are the ones who have lost that as a result of this nuclear agreement. This is something that has to be borne in mind and understood by people in the West. People who have gained are people who have, as a consequence of their own experiences over the last 36 years, seen that there is nothing to be gained by pursuing policies that isolates Iran, that policies that ostracizes Iran. And they should be encouraged. That's why this nuclear agreement is a feather in the cap of uh, Mr. Rouhani and Mr. Zarif, who have done a good job in pushing Iran away from the likes of Ahmadinejad to some sort of a uh, position that has some offers the people and the country and its relationship with the West some positive prospects. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that that uh, uh, Iran is a an, is a great civilization um, with incredible people that dates back to biblical times and has an incredible heritage and culture um, of being one of the ancient people um, that are still very much uh, around today, very similar to that of Israel and the Jewish people. But but isn't the whole concentration and power in the hands of uh, the supreme leader of Iran, um, Khomeini, rather than actually Rouhani? So he may have changed the maybe the face of the regime, but the ultimate power in Iran rests with a supreme leader and uh, we all already still see death chance to Israel, death chance to, to America with this agreement and uh, a, a leading um, uh, US um, Middle East expert who uh, worked very closely at the Pentagon wrote a very interesting article warning the Obama administration, it was a report, saying how that the Iranians see this negotiation as weakness, the Iranian regime and the supreme leader, that this is nothing but weakness on behalf of the West. We can use this to get what we want. We can get the sanctions uh, lifted so that we can then preserve our regime. We can then continue to pursue our goal of having nuclear weapons to preserve the actual regime. First of all, I mean, that is, a, that is a ridiculous statement that, by, that this agreement facilitates the acquisition of nuclear weapons for Iran, at, at least in the context of the terms of this agreement, which is the next 15 years. That is a totally ridiculous assertion. But the fact is that Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, has changed his position has moved away from the kind of policies, as I said, that has isolated Iran. Because for pragmatic reasons, as a consequence of his own experiences, when Mr. Khatami came to power in 1997 and wanted to promote a reformist agenda, Mr. Khamenei in Iran did not go along with him. But he had many, many options at the time. Those options became less and less over time. So with time, he also saw the light, and he moved away from those extremist positions and facilitated uh, the, you might say, Iran's road to recovery from isolation and sanctions to a position where if this agreement goes through and, you know, if sanctions are lifted, that the Iranian people might have a chance to breathe and might have a chance to prosper. 
because that at the end of the day is something that he as the supreme leader one, one thinks would want for his own people so i don't i don't want to doubt that now those there are certain people who have made u-turns as a consequence of failed policies and there are some people in iran with a vested interest to continue along those lines what has happened in the last 36 years is that that the const that constituency of hardliners has become reduced and reduced and smaller and smaller the next step is to try to disarm them completely so that all the key decisions are made by people who see Iran approaching and moving in a different direction. But that has to happen inside Iran and with the support of the Iranian people and under completely different circumstances. But to say that these people set the agenda for everything, that hasn't happened because they didn't want this agreement in the first place, just as some people in the West don't want the agreement. But with one difference, that people in Israel or in the United States, the Republicans who keep saying it, are opposing this agreement, perhaps to some extent because of domestic political reasons. But they're not benefiting personally or their constituency as a result, financially as a result of uh, what goes on. But the constituency in Iran that didn't want this, didn't, doesn't want it because it is bound to lose millions of dollars of uh, revenues that it was making for itself as a consequence of pursuing this useless policy to the detriment of the Iranian people. The Republicans want to oppose Obama. Netanyahu wants to consolidate his position within Israel. These are some of the factors that, you know, figure in to the kind of statements that is coming out. But the, for the Iranians who are opposing it, they're not concerned about anything domestic. Because if it was up to a vote, they would never be voted anything. But they don't want to lose their prime position. Sanctions on Iran facilitated a lot of people in the black market who were being sort of championed through these various ports, that 14 or 15 ports that had no excise, no duties, nothing, and, and brought in goods and you know, dumped it on the market. All of these things will be closed once the economy starts getting going once economic reconstruction begins. And, you know, people talk about $150 billion. First of all, you have to bear in mind that all of the campaigns in which the Iranian regime has been engaged over the years, not just now, I'm talking about going back, Hezbollah, Yemen, Iraq, whatever, Afghanistan, these are not high-budget enterprises. They have managed to support their surrogates over the years with the sanctions and with everything. In Yemen, they're not spending thousands of billions of dollars in order to support the Houthis. There is domestic unrest over there. They have used this in an opportunistic way to exert some sort of influence and to bargain eventually with the Saudis over some kind of a resolution in Syria. So. They don't need $150 billion extra in order to pursue those policies. So you have to have a different approach. That, that is what I, the crux of my message is, that you need a different approach because these are different times. And you're dealing with different people. The values and the ideals of 36 years ago are not the priorities of the day. And on those bases, I think that if, you know, uh, if a different approach is taken, you know, that uh, it could possibly provide the kind of answers which more hostile, more, uh, you might say, aggressive forms of uh, approach had, had failed to deliver in the past. Uh, so we can see now in the, U in the U.S. there is a real battle over the Iran deal between the Democrats and the Republicans and that battle is taking place in Congress. And here's some of the adverts that have been played in the United States, one supporting the Iran deal and the other one opposing the Iran deal. I love playing frisbee with my sons. I love the sound of the waves on the Pacific at sunrise. I love curling up with a good book. I love to see my grandkids smile.
But if Congress sabotages the nuclear deal with Iran? We could be denied the very moments that make our lives worth living. Why? Dude, because we'd be dead. Super dead. Like totally fried by a major nuclear bomb dead. I won't be able to play Frisbee with my sons because there won't even be a Frisbee. The Frisbee will be melted. We will be melted. Or worse, toasted? Yes, Natasha, but most people think toast is delicious. This would not be that kind of toast. It would be like a really dark, unpleasant cloud of death toast. Whoa, 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 whoa! We're not actually worried about Iran dropping a nuclear weapon on the United States. Holy sh**! Is that... Yes, Jack, it's me, Queen Noor from Jordan. Look, it is true that if Congress sabotages this deal, there would be nothing stopping Iran from getting the bomb. That would likely spark an arms race throughout the region. Precisely, Ambassador Pickering. Ultimately, we could be forced into a war with Iran, another dangerous, drawn-out, and expensive conflict in the Middle East with many lives lost. So wait, are you saying that instead of a quick, toasting type of death, that in a war with Iran, maybe a lot of people would die much more slowly? Like, like if they were put into, say, an immense crock pot for a really, really long time? Natasha, I don't think you need a surrealistic food metaphor to comprehend the sheer recklessness of a war with Iran. Once a war begins, the chances of Iran developing a nuclear weapon would only increase. Wait a second. That's Valerie Plame. Valerie Plame is in this flipping video. Valerie, do you know that because you're a spy? I'm not going to answer that question, Jack. I think what Valerie is saying is that the agreement currently on the table is the best way to ensure Iran doesn't build a bomb. And it gives the international community unprecedented access to verify that Iran is keeping up its end of the bargain. A strong deal built on international diplomacy is the best way forward. And the alternative to that is war. War with Iran is a really bad idea. The worst idea ever. Look, we all love our children and the Iranians love their children. And <laughs> we've got a deal on the table that keeps us all safe. Do me a favor, okay? Don't let some hot-headed member of Congress screw that up. Because playing politics with our national security is actually not all that funny. Call Congress, tell them, support diplomacy. It's the only sane solution. And believe me when I say to you, I hope the Iranians love their children too. Stink. Uh, we can see from there that uh, Obama and the uh, Democrats have spent a lot of money in hiring uh, American celebrities to uh, support the Obama, the Obama deal, which is the Iran deal uh, in this case, as there's a big battle going on in Congress. But uh, this is what um, a Republican from Prager University thinks about the Iran deal. We say that evil is dark, but this metaphor is imprecise. Evil is actually intensely bright, so painfully bright that people look away from it. Many even deny its existence. Why? Because once people acknowledge evil's existence, they know they have to confront it. And most people prefer not to confront evil. That is what led to World War II and the death of 55 million people. Many in the West denied the darkness of Nazism. They looked the other way when that evil could have been stopped and then appeased it as it became stronger. We are reliving 1938, the year that democratic Western nations assured a police state, the Nazi regime, that they would do nothing to prevent its expansion. That year, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain went to Munich to negotiate with Adolf Hitler. He left believing Hitler's promises of peace in exchange for Germany being allowed to annex large parts of Czechoslovakia. Upon returning to England, Chamberlain announced peace for our time. The 2015 agreement between America, Europe, Russia, China, and Iran mirrors 1938. The Nazi regime was a police state the Islamic Republic of Iran is a police state. The Nazis' greatest aim was to exterminate the Jews of Europe. Iran's greatest aim is to exterminate the Jewish state. The West dismissed Hitler as the Jews' problem. The West dismisses Iran 
as Israel's problem. Nazi Germany hated the West and its freedoms. The Islamic Republic of Iran hates the West and its freedoms. Germany sought to dominate Europe. Iran seeks to dominate the Middle East and the Muslim world. And just as Britain and France appeased Nazi Germany, the same two countries along with the United States have chosen to appease Iran. In fact, there's considerably less defense for the Iran Agreement, which awards Iran $150 billion in currently frozen assets and the right to keep its nuclear program, than there was for the Munich Agreement. Prior to 1938, Hitler had not publicly proclaimed his aim to annihilate Europe's Jews. Yet Iran has been proclaiming its intention to annihilate the Jewish state for decades. There were no massive death to America demonstrations in Germany, as there regularly are in Iran. In 1938, Germany had not been responsible for terror around the world, as Iran is now. Nor was Germany responsible for the death of more than a thousand Americans, as Iran has been in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Lebanon. The Neville Chamberlains of 2015 defend the agreement with Iran on two grounds, that the only alternative is war, and that this agreement has the capacity to bring Iran into the, quote, community of nations. The war argument is a falsehood for three reasons. First, the alternative to this agreement was continuing and tightening the sanctions that were weakening the Iranian regime and greatly diminishing its ability to fund terror groups around the world. Second, because the agreement so strengthens Iran, it makes war far more likely. When evil expansionist regimes get richer, they don't spend their wealth on building new hospitals. They expand. Third, Iran has been at war with America for decades. And whoever believes that the agreement will bring Iran into the, quote, community of nations betrays a breathtaking ignorance of the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime is composed of religious fanatics who are morally indistinguishable from ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and all the other mass murdering Islamist movements. The Iranian regime has executed more people than any country except China and killed more than 6,000 Iranians just for being homosexual. A woman in Iran is not allowed to leave the country without the permission of her husband. The Iranian regime repeatedly calls for the extermination of Israel. No other country in the world is committed to annihilating another country. Iran is already the world's greatest funder of terror organizations. Imagine what it will do with another $150 billion. Imagine what it will do with the removal of the current weapons and missile embargo. Imagine what it will do with its intact nuclear infrastructure. This deal allows all three. Very few people have a chance to do something about the greatest evil of their time. When it votes on this agreement, the American Congress has that chance. I'm Dennis Prager. Uh, Meridad, we have about uh, two minutes uh, left of the program. Um, we, we saw there two very different campaigns that are really taking place in the United States over the Iran deal. But um, why isn't there that same kind of introspection about this deal in, here in Britain and also in Europe as there is in the United States? Well, I think domestic issues ha 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 have a great deal to do with it. And, uh, and of course, the, there's a greater desire for drama like the one we saw right now rejecting the deal, you know, which was a preposterous sort of comparison uh, and totally, totally unreal. But it's quite effective, I suppose, within certain constituencies who want to look at the world, who want to look at issues like that. Uh, I think the, the earlier one about with the Hollywood actors and so on, uh, they are people who are uh, projecting uh, emphasis on life and on how you know, we should try to get along with one another. I'm the first to admit that, uh, that the Iranian regime's behavior in the past has been unacceptable. Ahmadinejad is a pariah, he's a disgrace. You know, I, as an Iranian, feel absolutely ashamed of having, ever having had someone like that in that kind of a position. 
But the fact is that the Iranian people and the Islamic establishment allowed for him to be removed from the scene. And we are dealing with a different, you know, sort of group of people who are trying to project a different image. That should be encouraged. Okay. Uh, Meridad, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's uh, European report. I mean, you're a credit to your nation and the, uh, the people of Iran, um, certainly in all the work that you've been doing. So very much thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And I uh, just want to thank you for watching uh, today's uh, European report uh, about the Iran deal. I think it's something that uh, we do hope it is uh, peace in our time uh, rather than uh, Iran developing uh, nuclear weapons and continuing its course of supporting international terrorism around the world. I guess only time will tell. So I want to thank you for watching today's program.